Good morning. I want to show you a picture. Please have a look. What do we see here? Who are these people? And, and what are they doing? Well, the little girl there is Gulam. She's 11 years old. And the man sitting next to her is Faiz. He's 40 years old. No, he's not her father. In fact, until the day that this picture was taken, they had never met each other. This is the picture of their wedding day. It's the day when Gulam's youth ended and she lost her freedom. And what happened next? Well, we can assume that Gulan was taken out of school if her parents ever allowed her to go to school. And so she will probably have to prove her fertility by having many babies and starting to have them very quickly. Now look at her and think of a young girl, 12, 13, 14 years old, giving birth tiny bodies, it's no surprise that girls who are 15 years or younger, when they have their first baby, are five times more likely to get injured or to die in childbirth than girls and women who are 18 years or older. And their children are much more likely to be poor, to be ill. Now look at him. He's probably been around sexually. So there's a good chance that he will bring sexually transmittable diseases, maybe even HIV, into their marriage. And we can be pretty sure that she will from now onwards be living with her husband and her in-laws, who will tell whether she can leave the house or not, and she'll be basically be taking care of them. This practice is called child marriage. And it won't only affect the human rights of Gulam and her potential for development, but in fact, it harms the whole community where she lives because of the health risks associated with child marriage, because of the fact that she will never make a full economic contribution to her family and her society. I don't know if you've ever heard about the Millennium Development Goals. These are eight objectives that the world has set to itself to try to reduce poverty. Now, child marriage is directly affecting six out of the eight Millennium Development Goals. Education, maternal health, infant health, preventable diseases, women's equality or inequality, and poverty. But Gulam's story is not unique. Until I started working on this issue of child marriage two years ago, almost two years ago, I had no clue how big this practice is. We are talking about 10 million girls under the age of 18 who are getting married every year. That means that today, 27,000 girls are getting married. Some 15 or 16 years old. Some will be like Gulam, 11 or 12 years old. But I've met girls who were as young as six or seven. Now, this is happening all over the world, primarily in sub saharan Africa and in South Asia but also in the Middle East, also in countries in, in Latin America, and even here in the West, in the Netherlands, there are communities that marry their girls at a very young age. And you might think, what role does religion play? Well, there is not one religion that says, marry your girls young, before the age of 18. Yet, child marriage is happening among Christians, among Hindus, among um, Islam. 
And often it's the religious leaders who are actually performing the act of marriage, or at least they're not doing enough to prevent it. Now, I am determined to see an end to this practice. And you know what? I actually think that it can be done in one generation. Let me tell you how. In order to know how to solve a problem, we obviously need to understand what is driving it. And I am convinced that there is not one father nor one mother in the world who actually wants to hurt their children. So what is it that makes the parents of Gulam and other parents think that it is in the best interest of their daughters and of their family that these girls get married so young? Well, the first reason is poverty. In many places, there's a financial transaction when you marry. For example, in India, the younger the girl is and the less education she's had, the cheaper it is to marry her out. The dowry is low. Or in Africa, where you actually get money when you marry your daughters, you could want to marry them off because you need new cattle or something. The second reason is security. In many communities, sexual activity before marriage brings shame, eternal shame, on the girl and on her family. And so in order to avoid any of these potential problems, the girls get married off before they become sexually active. The third reason is gender inequality. We're more than 60 years since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states that we are all equal. But guess what? Women and girls are still, in many, many places, second-class citizens. Girls, and I've heard it a lot of times on my travels, are seen as a burden that you want to get rid of as quickly as you can. The fourth reason, and maybe the most important one, is tradition. Girls like Gulam are married at such a young age because that's the way that we've done it in our community, in our village, for generations after generation. And imagine if the parents of Gulam did not want to marry her out at the age of 11. Could they do that? Now, probably the whole community will look at them. What's wrong with that girl? And what is wrong with those parents that they don't want to marry her? Now, the organization I work for, the Elders, has started a campaign called Girls Not Brides, which is a global partnership of everybody in the world who is working or who wants to work to end this harmful practice of child marriage. And what we are trying to do is basically four things. First of all, we need to start talking about this practice. These 10 million girls are currently completely invisible. They don't go to school, they don't go to health clinics. Even making pictures like this is incredibly difficult. So we need to make them visible. And, and I've often wondered, how can it be that such a big problem, with such harmful consequences, is getting so little visibility? Now, I think that has to do with the fact that we're talking here about social norms and culture and tradition, all things that are sensitive to talk about. Because before you know it, you'll be accused of being a cultural imperialist, sticking your nose in other people's business. But I don't think that's a good enough reason not to talk about it. The next thing we need to do is we need to tackle harmful traditions. And it can be done, not one family at a time, but one community at a time, if they collectively decide that slavery or food binding, or hopefully in the future child marriage, 
is a bad practice, it can actually be changed. Grassa Michelle, the wife of Nelson Mandela, puts it beautifully when she says, traditions are made by people, so traditions can be changed by people. Now, the way to do that is by bringing together the community, the leaders, the wise men, the religious leaders, the women, and talk in an informed way about what is the damage that child marriage is doing to your community, not just to your girls, but to you, the collective. And that obviously has to be done in a very respectful way, and it can't be done by outsiders like me. But I've seen places, in fact, in Western Africa, for example, there are more than 6,000 villages that have now decided that it's against their best interest to continue this harmful practice. The third thing that we can do is invest in girls. Make sure that girls can stay in school by giving financial rewards to the parents, by giving the girls uniforms, books, so that they can actually go there. But there are also other ways. For example, in Ethiopia, I've seen programs where you have school clubs and or girls' clubs, and the girls come together and, and they find strength in, in being together. And then one, when they find out that one of them might be married off, they start speaking out collectively and they alert the teachers or other people who can help to stop it. And the fourth thing that we can do is make sure that laws get implemented. Most countries in the world actually do have laws that prohibit child marriage, but they're not getting implemented. And so we need to make sure that we educate the police, the judges, the parents, the girls themselves, about the fact that this is actually a practice that is outside the law. So where does it leave us? Well, imagine is religious and traditional leaders and the influential men and fathers and mothers and boys all realize that marrying the girls of their community off at a young age is not just bad for the girl, but it's also against their own well-being and the, the, well, and the, the richness of their, of their village. Imagine if Gulam's sister, her younger sister, could actually stay in school and remain healthy and have her children at an age that she wants and marry at the time when she wants? I am convinced if things were like that, then girls like Gulam will probably decide that their daughters will stay in school and will definitely not get married before they have reached the age of 18 which means we can end child marriage in one generation. Let's make it happen. Thank you, Thank you now, so Jim, much. You know what you can do? Tell me. And what everybody here can do? First of all, start talking about this. Help to make these 10 million girls visible. Go to the website of Girls Not Brides, sign up, become part of this force, this wave of change. And lastly, if you can afford it, give financial support to the very courageous organizations that are on the ground actually working to help tackle these traditions. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Mabel van Oranje. A special contribution.